Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship today here at St. Mark. I see some family and uh, relatives are here. We especially welcome you and trust that God will bless the worship of all of us in spirit and in truth. We've designated today as Walking Together Sunday. Walking Together is the English translation of the Greek words synod. A synod is a gathering of individuals and congregations to do together what you can't easily do by yourselves. Uh, Today is the fitting day because this past week now was the assignment of teaching graduates at Martin Luther College. This week is the assignment of vicar and pastor candidates at uh, Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary. You know, the, the, the product of so much of what we do together, both in training and then sending out. Please stand. Again, we follow the service of word and sacrament, page 26. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and to worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess I am by nature sinful, and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and deeds. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sin. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. rise to honor the reading of the gospel lesson. This lesson is the great commission of our risen and ascended Lord recorded in Matthew 28, beginning at verse 18. Then Jesus came to his disciples and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the gospel lesson of our Lord. Do you sense the awkwardness? I had to have you see this this morning and feel it. Here are people gathered, ripe and ready to hear the word of God, and the pulpit stands empty. Nobody to greet you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Nobody to take you deeper in the word and to expound the scriptural truths for you to grow deeper in faith and in love for God. Nobody to share with you the most 
important message of the scriptures that God forgives your sin. Can you imagine that 2,000 years ago? Because that's where this traces back to Pentecost Day. Medes and Elamites, Persians, Phrygians, people of Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, citizens of Rome and Judea, people from Cyrene, all gathered in around the temple, and Peter never stands up to preach his sermon because the Spirit never came. Can you imagine that? All those 3,000 people that were converted that day never hear about Jesus. What a sad thing. A sad scenario when the pulpit stands empty. That is not what God had in mind for his people. Sheep without a shepherd, Christians without their counselor, or empty pulpits is never what God had intended for the world or for you, his people. That would be like Pentecost never happening. That would be like life without purpose. What is your life about? Who is your life for? Because it's ultimately a life without promise. You have no eternal life because nobody shares that message with you. You have no forgiveness of sins and Jesus becomes some historical figure who just died on a cross. End of story. Do you get it? That's not the end of the story. Pentecost happened because God wants his word proclaimed. And the essence of the scripture is that God loves everybody. And he wants that message to go out to the world. Peter had to preach that sermon that day 2,000 years ago because the Spirit moved him to do that. And he wanted those people that day to hear the message of the gospel. And he wants you to People from Eau Claire, some from Asia, some from Italy, some who have Germanic roots, Norwegian roots, some who don't know who your background is. He wants you, too, who are gathered here today to hear the gospel in mind. I don't want there to be a question this morning about whether or not God has sent his Holy Spirit or wondering whether or not that's going to happen. He has done it. It has happened. Pentecost took place. He has sent his Spirit consistently through the preaching of the word, through the history of the church. And he sent the Spirit again this past weekend, not just today, but yesterday, as Pastor Paul mentioned, through the MLC calls. And he'll do it again this week through the seminary vicars and the pastoral candidates about to be assigned. Do you get it that the problem is not with God sending his spirit? He's done what he promised to do and he continues to do what he promised to do. The question for us today is, will you cash in on it? Will you cash in on the Holy Spirit's stimulus package, cashing in on the power of the gospel? and spending your witness to a world's dying spiritual economy. In your worship folder is recorded Acts 1, verse 8, and it says, And you will be my witnesses. Before that it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. As you all know, the government is in the middle of their own stimulus package, sending out their own stimulus checks, Economy's down, housing is down, gas is up, food prices are up, tough times. People are tightening up their financial belt. And in order to try and deal with it, the government said, well, we've taken a lot of money from you. Maybe we can give you a little bit back, make you excited. And maybe you'll take a little bit of that money and invest and inject it back into the economy and jumpstart something that's kind of flatlining. Some of you will get checks greater than others, and some of you won't get a dime. And who knows if it's really going to work? It might. God doesn't operate like that with his own stimulus package when he sends his spirit. First of all, he's willing to send his spirit through the word to anybody. 
And God, secondly, never takes from us, only to give a little bit back. Has God ever taken anything from you that, that he needs? I don't think so. God continues to give you everything you need for daily life, even despite the expense of daily life. God continues to give you what Christ Jesus did day after day after day. And the focus of today is that God continues to give you and the world through you his Holy Spirit. Did you see what happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus predicted what would happen on Pentecost? He said, and you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. That word power isn't just dynamite, even though that's where the word English dynamite comes from, dynamis. It means a miracle, but it means more than that. It means the power, the horsepower that's behind the miracle, the ability that's able to make that miracle happen. You will receive that horsepower gift when the Holy Spirit lights on you at Pentecost. Do you remember what happened on that day? Acts tells us the disciples were filled with the Spirit and they spoke in tongues or different languages. You see, God doesn't just give them a little bit. He filled them completely with the Holy Spirit. He didn't hold back from this. And there are a couple of miracles there, but none of these are the power miracle gift. First of all, they, gave, they received the Holy Spirit. They were filled with him. Secondly, they received the gift to be able to speak in different languages. But again, neither one of those is the power gift that Jesus was talking about. See if you can pick it out from this passage. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. It's not just that they had the Holy Spirit. They did. They already had him before this too. It's not just that they received this great gift to be able to speak in different languages, but that was a miracle. The horsepower miracle here is we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own language. They were proclaiming the gospel. That's the horsepower gift here, the power gift that God the Holy Spirit gave to them to be able to more fully, more adequately, more deeply explain and and clearly proclaim the word of God, the gospel, to the crowd that day. That's what Paul calls it too in Romans chapter 1. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God, the same Greek word that's used right here that Jesus uses in our text. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. That same power those apostles received that day so long ago is the same gospel horsepower that's at work right here. Except there's a big difference. What happened in one day for them is they received multiple miracles, especially the horsepower gift of the gospel. It doesn't happen in a day for us. It takes time to nurture what those apostles got in a single day. It takes time for us to train pastors and teachers to be ready for service. It takes time for pastors to learn the languages of Greek and Hebrew, Latin and German, to be able to study the past. It takes time to study the teachings of the Bible and it takes time to mature somebody to make sure this is really what they believe and they can adequately proclaim this. And it takes time to grow in the gospel. But you know, I don't think that's the most difficult part. I think God gives us time. He gives us time to nurture students to be ready for proclaiming the gospel. Do you know what I think is the most difficult part for us today? is for God to give us parents and congregational members willing to recognize the raw talents for public ministry in the kids of the congregation. And that parents would be willing to encourage the idea of public ministry to their kids, your kids. 
as I look back at my own history as I went through school, while I think the greatest miracle is the Holy Spirit's work on me to mature me and to teach me his truths, that's number one. But I think there's a very close miracle. And it's not the one that allowed me to learn Latin and German, Greek and Hebrew, although that's a miracle too. It's not the miracle as I was looking at the future of college my freshman year and thinking, I have no idea how I'm going to pay for this. Parents don't have the funds to be able to help. But God miraculously paid for all of it and got me through eight years. I think the neatest second great miracle is a mother and father who never forced this on me but who are willing to foster the idea of public ministry. Who would want to sit and listen to a sermon where a pastor or teacher thought this is what they were forced into doing? I wouldn't want to sit and listen to it. Do you understand? This is what I want to do. This is where I want to do it. And this is how I want to serve. But I had my doubts along the way. And if God hadn't put me through my parents in a place that would encourage and foster the idea of public ministry day after day, you know what? I don't think I'd be here. And having parents that were willing to give me up was a big deal. I'd like to say this in a little different way. Do you understand that no public school has ever converted somebody to be a Christian can guarantee that. Not one public school. To be fair, not one church has ever converted anybody either. That's something God alone does through his Holy Spirit. But if that's the way God works, through the word, by sending his Spirit to do that miraculous gift of changing hearts and lives, do you understand the schools around here, the public schools, they don't encourage the gospel and they don't encourage public ministry. Name for me one high school counselor around here that says to our kids, you know what? You would be a fantastic preacher or teacher. You could really help people by sharing the gospel with them. I don't think I'd ever hear that. And that's why our schools are so important, beginning with our very own right here. They have something the public schools will never have. And to be fair... It's not for them to have. It's not for them to teach. God hasn't given the gospel to the government schools to teach this. It's for us to teach. We're the church. And this is where he wants his gospel proclaimed. And I'd like to be fair one, in one more way, just so you understand. There are some fantastic teachers in the public schools. They have some fantastic programs. I'm not talking about that. But they don't have the power of the gospel day after day after day that can be clearly, publicly proclaimed to the kids. And to foster the idea of public ministry. They just don't. But we do. Our prep schools, our area Lutheran high schools, our colleges, our seminaries, that's what they have and that's what they proclaim. But it starts with you in the home. It starts with you as a congregation encouraging our youth to do this, saying even to the point, you know what, maybe you guys don't have the finances, but I'd, I'd love to partner up with you and help you through that. It starts by recognizing the raw talents, by encouraging it, and also by parents being willing to say, I'm willing to give you up. I understand I may not see you at Thanksgiving because you're busy on that day. I understand I may not see you at Christmas or Easter or on the major holidays, but you have important work to do. Isn't that what God himself did for us? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son for ministry. Will you cash in on the spirit stimulus package by recognizing the power of the gospel? The power that's here at work every day through word and sacrament and that's at work through the school. 
in the proclamation of the word. Cash in on it. Jesus says one more thing here. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. The disciples stared in disbelief at Jesus in the upper room on Easter Sunday as he came and appeared to them. They doubted the scriptures tell us. They still didn't get it. On Maundy Thursday, they walked into the Garden of Gethsemane with Jesus and there they talked and prayed for a little bit and finally the Sanhedrin soldiers came and the disciples fled like the cowards they were. And if I was there, I would have done the same thing. They weren't bold. But something changed in the meantime between Easter and Ascension and Pentecost. All of a sudden, they're willing to get up and just proclaim the scriptures. And that's a gift of the Spirit here, too. They were witnesses. That Greek word witness means somebody who's privy to pertinent courtroom testimony and information that's to the case at hand. Those apostles and disciples were eyewitnesses to everything Jesus had done, beginning with John's baptism all the way to Jesus' ascension. And they had the testimony to tell the world. Your sins are forgiven. We know this is true. We saw everything he did. And he really fulfilled the scriptures as our substitute. And that's why we walk together and work together. To walk together as a congregation. To continue to foster the idea of youth who will fill pulpits and classrooms in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. But you understand that's only half the equation. The flip side of the coin is not just to have people that will fill empty pulpits and classrooms. But that you as God's people would continue to witness to Christ to fill empty pews. Jesus says we are his witnesses. As much as you are a male or a female, and that's really, in a way, part of who you are. Jesus says this is not something I'm forcing you to do. You have to be my witness. He's saying this is who you are. Being a Christian, you are God's witness. That's what you're characterized by. This is what you will do and who you will be. Because that's what the Holy Spirit makes you to be. Do you understand the best way to be God's witness or some of the best ways to walk together and to be his witnesses? To be honestly blunt, is to continue to generously support God's ministry, not just here at St. Mark, but through our Wisconsin Synod. And we've included a special offering right inside your bulletin. Consistent proportionate, planned, generous, godly giving is one way to be God's witness. You may never f figure out or find out who was converted in Africa or Asia or Indonesia by funds that you sent through your congregation to the Wisconsin Synod, but you will see them in heaven. You may never find out which one of our kids becomes a preacher someday or a teacher. But you will see the results of the work they do one day. And that's why we join together. I praise God that you have been so generous up to this day that we've been able to make ends meet through our, through our own congregation. But you understand there's so much more we could do. Not just here, but also through the Wisconsin Synod. There are so many mission opportunities second way that you can help be God's witness is by taking advantage of Bible study opportunities. As important as Sunday worship is or weekend worship, it is. It's a priority. Do you have 45 more minutes? Do you have 50 minutes to walk just a few steps down the hallway? I understand I mention this frequently, but in Bible study is where the power of the Holy Spirit works and strengthens you in faith, and encourages you to have a better witness about Christ through your trained pastors and teachers. God doesn't stimulate the world 
by sending them more toys, by sending them more money, by sending them more stuff like our government does. God stimulates the world by sending them you and me to witness. This world's economy, spiritually speaking, without Christ is going to hell. And you have the answers. And you have the testimony of the apostles written right here. And it's true. And that's how you cash in on the Spirit's stimulus package. By taking this word to them. Are you willing? Are you willing to put yourself around the gospel to trust it? And to encourage and foster the idea of ministry? Are you willing to spend your witness to this dying world? If you will. Not only will you fill empty pulpits, but by the Spirit's work, you'll fill empty, ungodly hearts and lives with the gospel of peace. May God bless us all to do that. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God which surpasses all our understanding, may it guide and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Who taught us to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace. Live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with the gladness that the Holy Spirit gives. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. <laughs>